Transportation has come a long way, from quality to speed to a general understanding of how these big scary metal monsters work. It's a far cry from pushing a wheel up a hill. With experience comes a better understanding of the transportation and the safety for those who use it. So let's go back to a time when none of that existed. Today, we'll take a look at the incredible amount of mistakes made to cause the Melbourne street wreck. The date was November 1st, 1918. The location was the New York Subway Brighton Line in the Brooklyn Borough. At about 6.42 p.m. at the end of rush hour, a five-car elevated train carrying 650 passengers was traveling towards Prospect Park, but something was horribly wrong. An elevated train is a rapid transit railway constructed above street level. The Melbourne train was primarily constructed out of wood, traveling into a tunnel below Melbourne Street when it approached a curve that should have been easy to navigate at about 6 miles per hour or 10 kilometers per hour. This train was traveling 30 to 40 miles per hour or 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, so it was headed for an obvious disaster. Hitting the curve at such speeds caused the back wheels of the first car to immediately derail and take the rest of the cars with it immediately obliterating the left side and roof of the train. The train came to an abrupt stop when it collided with a concrete partition between the north and southbound tracks. The nightmare had stopped moving, but it still wasn't over, as hundreds of passengers were trapped in a dark tunnel of twisted steel, splinters, and glass. Nearly every passenger in the first car was killed in the accident. Most passengers in the second car as well, the impact was fast and violent, as one man was reported to have been impaled on a steel shard that stuck up like a javelin. The rescue team took 45 minutes to descend into the tunnel, and their efforts were slow due to the wreckage. By 11 p.m., 85 bodies had been pulled from the tunnel, and the injured were sent to a nearby hospital. Thanks to the Spanish flu, the hospital was at capacity so a special infirmary had to be made for the 250 injured passengers. The accident was quick, but what made it interesting was the series of events that caused this tragedy. One major element that caused the accident was a lack of experience. On the very day of the crash, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers representing most of the motormen operating elevated trains in the area went on strike due to union issues. As a result, the companies were operating on a bare-bones staff, using only non-striking workers who would work with less experience just to make a paycheck. Enter 25-year-old Antonio Edward Luciano, who was left to operate the Melbourne train the day of the accident. Originally a crew dispatcher, who had never operated an elevated train in passenger service before, it was baptism by fire for him that day, and he was put behind the controls. With less than three hours of classroom training and no certification, on top of the fact that Luciano was mourning the death of his infant daughter, who succumbed to the Spanish flu and was recovering from the flu himself, he wasn't quite in the right headspace to do the job. Miraculously, coming out unharmed from the accident, Luciano simply walked away from the crash like he wasn't involved. When asked what happened, he replied, I don't know, I lost control of the damn thing. Just hours after the accident, the strike was dropped. Unfortunately, it was little too late. How the train was configured was also playing a part in the damage caused. Consisting of three motor cars and two trailer cars, Motor cars being twice as heavy, standard procedure was to have one motor car between two trailer cars to weigh them down and equal out the force. On this train, however, two trailer cars were coupled together, making them easier to derail when they hit the curb at high speeds. These were the cars that delivered the most damage to themselves and the passengers within. The angle of the curve was also under investigation, as it was a new addition to the route. It had only opened weeks before the accident and had replaced a straight route that seemed safer to traverse. 
Many trains chose to use the original route for this reason, and after the accident, engineers pointed a finger at the faulty construction of the curve. Of course, a major contributor to the accident was the intense speed at which the train was traveling. During an interview, Luciano claimed he tried to slow the train, but investigation proved that he neither tried to engage the emergency brake or reverse the engine in any way, so we're not sure exactly what he thought he did to help. Surviving passengers explained that the motorman had spent the whole trip overshooting stations and failing to keep the train under speed. He had issues applying the brakes on downhill portions of the track, so it was easy to see how the building speed could get out of control. Luciano and the company responsible were both charged for manslaughter. The motorman was quick to place blame on the train, stating that he did everything he could to slow it, but it just wasn't responding. The company fired back, stating that the man had not tried to engage emergency procedures to stop the train, and that he was sleep-deprived and had a severe lack of experience. It was a combination of neglect, poor construction, and inexperience that put both parties at fault. The company paid out millions to families of the victims and for damages, then were forced to rework their wooden trains and add safety devices like speedometers, headlights, and dead man switches. Today, this still holds the title of deadliest subway accident in New York history. It was a prime example of convenience coming before safety and working with whatever they had during a hard time. At least we got some safety procedures out of it, and we learned that inexperienced, sleep-deprived, hard-headed, morning, sick motormen may not be the best person for the job. Thanks for watching. For more true crime and horror, please consider subscribing. Game with me on Twitch, follow me on Twitter, and as always, be well. <laughs>